Well, as I mentioned um, in, my, in my prayer just now, uh, we're beginning a new series this week, uh, and it's going to be a truly a cover-to-cover journey through the Bible, looking at what it means to worship and to be a worshiper. And when I was talking to Pastor Phil about this and, and what, what this might look like and how we could uh, get a, a full biblical picture of what it means to worship, we, we considered looking at different types of of uh, writing in Scripture. So if you're familiar with the Bible, you, you understand and you know that not every part of the Bible reads or is written the same. Uh, you have historical narrative, which tells a story about here's some people and here's what they did. You have, you have poetry, you have songs, you have wisdom literature, right? It's just you know, the Proverbs, that sort of a thing. You have New Testament letters to the church. You have the Gospels, which are narratives about the life and ministry of Jesus. You have the book of Revelation, which is prophecy about things to come. You have Old Testament prophecies. There's all these different genres in Scripture, and we thought, what if we took a look at uh, a sample, really, from each one of those different genres and what it means to worship? Not so that we can look at, here's seven different ways to worship, but that's so we could look at, here's seven different approaches where the same theme runs through all of them, where you can see consistently from Genesis to Revelation What God is looking for in a worshiper has always been the same. There's nothing new. He doesn't say, now we're on to this next stage of history, and now instead of this, now I want you to worship like this. No, the theme has always been the same throughout all of human history. So we're going to look at what worship looked like before the Old Testament law, what it looked like under the Old Testament law, in the Psalms, in wisdom literature, in the gospel, in the New Testament letters, and in Revelation which really becomes a preview uh, of of eternity. Uh, We will introduce and practice different ways of expressing worship during this seven weeks. So some of you are uncomfortable even just hearing that, like, oh no, what sort of weird things are we going to have to do? Some of you are saying, well, I've already been to a liturgical church where he says something, then I say something, and we just do it, and I don't want to go back to that. Don't worry about it. Don't, Don't worry about it. This will be a good experience for us. I'm not telling you you have to enjoy everything we do, but you don't do it for us anyway. That's not what worship is about, and maybe that's where I should start. That was a good amen. Yeah, that's a good place for one. So I think where we want to start this seven-week journey is by defining and understanding what true worship actually is, because it wouldn't make sense if over the next seven weeks we said, hey, here's all these different ways that people worshiped and what God asked for without ever saying, here's what worship is actually is. So we're actually going to start in John's gospel, which is not the beginning of the Bible, but we are going to start in John's gospel, and then we're going to compare and contrast two stories from the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible, and this is, these stories are from times before there was an Old Testament law which God, in which God said, this is how I want you to worship. So this, I think, will be interesting if you follow along here. So we're going to start in John chapter 4 verses 1 through 24. And I'm not going to read this whole thing. I want to summarize most of this story for you, and then I want to highlight a couple of the verses that we're really going to focus on, not just today, but probably in the coming weeks as well. So the story here in John 4, 1 through 24, is Jesus is wandering through the countryside, not lost, but on a mission. He's wandering through the countryside, and he comes uh, to a place called Samaria. Now, Samaria... Look, I got some flack for making North Dakotan jokes a couple weeks ago, but Samaria was North Dakota to these guys, okay? I'm going to double down today. It was that place, it was that place, no, I don't really mean that, but it, and Samaria was this place where the Jews had, you know, they kind of thumbed their noses at the Samaritans. They, they looked down on the, on the Samaritans because they were, they were a, what they would have called a half-breed. They were Jewish only halfway, and that the Jews had intermingled with some other people, and they weren't, they weren't purebred Jews, and this really bothered some of the really religious Jews. And so Samaria was a place that respectable Jews would avoid, but Jesus' travel took him right through the places that the religious people found, you know, objectionable, which I love about Jesus. He says, no, we're not going around it, we're going right through it. So they go through Samaria. While he's there, he comes upon a well, which was a community gathering of places, um, and they obviously it was actually a well, but people would gather there, and they would, you know, kind of like gathering on the water cooler, and they would talk about what was going on. And while he was there at the well, there is a woman there at the well who is drawing water out for her family. Now, for one thing, 
Jesus would have been disrespected for going through Samaria. And for a second thing, he certainly shouldn't have been talking to a woman. I mean, women, if you will recall, or if you don't know, listen now, the women in that day and, and age were, were viewed as second-class citizens, which as, as we looked when we went through the book of Colossians, which is a series we just finished, we, we looked at how much emphasis and how much um, gratitude was given to women in the church and their role. The gospel really transcended the cultural boundaries. It truly did. So Jesus is there talking to a woman at the well, and he says, hey, will you give me a drink? And she says, whoa, wait a minute. You can't talk to me. You're a Jew, and I'm a woman, and I'm a Samaritan. You can't talk to me. And he says, look, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you wouldn't object to this, basically. This is the new Matt translation, the nearly inspired version, okay? Um, so the lady says, hey, you don't have anything to get water with. What are, you supposed, what are you supposed to do? And Jesus says, look, you could give me as much of this water as you want, but you'll keep being thirsty. But I can give you water that will make you never thirst again. I can give you living water. And she said, I want some. Give me some of that water so I never have to get thirsty again. And he says, okay, well, why don't you go get your husband and tell him to come back? And she says, uh, I don't have one. I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five. <laughs> so technically, he was right. Uh, you, yeah, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the guy you're with now, he's not your husband either. And she, I, I imagine, is probably a little embarrassed at this point. But she says, I can see that you're a prophet. I'm glad that you see the humor in that because when I read things in the Bible, I laugh sometimes and I think, I wonder if that's supposed to be funny, but I, yeah. Either that or he was like stalking her on Facebook, but it probably wasn't that. So I can see that you are a prophet. And she says, because of that, now she goes, oh, this is a holy man, right? And she says, our people, our ancestors used to worship here on this great mountain. This was the place where we were called to worship. And Jesus says, look, lady, there is a time coming when you will worship God, neither on this mountain nor in the city of Jerusalem, which was, you know, the great place to go worship. He said, you Samaritans, you worship what you don't even really know. Listen to what he says here. This is verses 23 and 24. He says, the time is coming, indeed it's here right now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So Jesus here plainly and clearly explains what kind of worshipers God is looking for, what kind God commends. And Jesus says the kind of worshipers that God seeks, that God is looking for, are those who worship in spirit and truth. Now, in our English translations, we miss this because it makes it look like this is two separate things. Those who worship in spirit and those who worship in truth. But this is actually two sides of the same coin. He's looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Not two separate ideas, but one idea in two parts. But before I get into that too much, you know what struck me in this passage? We spend a lot of time in worship, and appropriately so, seeking God. But do you know what it said here? Did you notice this? That God is actually looking for us at the same time which I think we'll see is also a theme throughout all of Scripture, that God is looking for a certain type of worshiper, that God is actively seeking people who will worship him like this. So what we have here in John chapter 4 is Jesus revealing the type of worship that God wants, the type of worship that he desires. It is, first of all, worship in spirit. Now, in some of your Bible translations, um, depending on which you're reading from, you may see the word spirit capitalized there. He's looking for people who worship in the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit. That is not the best translation of what is going on there. He is not specifically saying you can only worship through the Holy Spirit, although as followers of Christ, we, we know that that is the case. What he is saying to this lady is it's about your heart. The Spirit is the seat of human emotion and attitude, little s, Spirit, okay? So when he's saying... God is looking for people who worship in spirit. He is saying we're lo he's looking for worshipers who have their entire heart and life engaged in worship of God. What it means to be you, what you who you are in your spirit, what you are in your spirit, that is, the sort, that is what you want to give to God. That's the sort of worship that God desires. But notice also that he says, and keep in mind the context here, this is important. 
The lady, once she figures out that Jesus is a man of God, says, hey, we worship on this mountain. And Jesus says, I don't, God doesn't really care where you worship. Worship is not confined by location or style. You do not have to be in this building to worship God. You don't have to be in any particular building to worship God. God doesn't live here. This is not his address. You would think sometimes with the junk mail that we get that maybe somebody does think that God actually lives here, but he doesn't. He doesn't live here. In fact, what Scripture tells us is that if you are born again, if you have put your faith and your hope in Christ, God's Spirit lives in you. You are the temple where God lives now. So doesn't it make sense then that we would give then everything back to God? It engages our entire heart and our life. It's not confined by a location or style of worship, and I think that's important to understand too. There's not a particular type of worship that God says, you know, I'm kind of cool with those new choruses, but I dig the old hymns before the whippersnappers messed up worship music. Like, God doesn't say that. If it is sincere and from the heart, God loves it. He loves it. Worship in truth is not about how we feel, okay? The emphasis here is on it is important to worship God as He is, not as we picture Him to be. That is so important. There are a lot of times, uh, Scripture uses a lot of different metaphors to describe who God is and what He is like to help us understand God's nature and His character. But we do not have open license to just create God in our image and say, that's the God I want to worship. We must worship Him in truth. All real worship, true worship, is focused on and points to Jesus. It sings about, it talks about what He has done, who He is. Yes, we can sing about and we can praise God for what He has done in our lives and how great He is to us. If you think that's not possible, you're going to have to tear out Psalms from your Bible because all of Psalms is here's my life, it was an absolute mess, and then God showed up and He fixed it, and I trust Him, and I love Him, and thank you, God, for sparing me. So it's not that our worship can't say anything about us, but it's always focused on God. It always points to Jesus and what He has done. But ultimately, true worship is demonstrated by real-life obedience. It leads us to do something. To worship in truth, then, means that when we leave these doors, we are still worshipers. Do you understand what I'm saying? That if worship is not confined to a location or a particular style or a particular time, then everything that we can do, whether in word or deed, boy, that sounds a lot like Colossians, because it is from Colossians, we can do to the glory of God. True worshipers demonstrate worship in real life obedience. There. Now we have an understanding of what it means to worship in spirit and truth. To worship in spirit, this is about the condition of your heart and your attitude. It's about who you are and what's going on inside of you. Worship can happen anywhere, can be done in different God-honoring ways. True worship is a lifestyle, not an event. Worship in truth means that it is genuine and real, based not on how I feel, but on who God is. True worship will always point us to Jesus. It never draws attention to us. That's, by the way, a great indicator that worship is not sincere. Ultimately, true worship leads to a life of obedience and faithfulness. Sometimes I think we feel that worship is this sort of like mystical interlude in the midst of real life right? Like there's difficult times in life, there's really hard things in life, and then I just need to step out of real life and worship God. That's not true worship. That Cassie nailed it this morning when she invited us to worship. She said, look, the right time to worship is when you're right in the middle of this garbage. That's when you really worship. You don't set aside that stuff and say, oh, that doesn't matter right now. I'm going to pretend like that doesn't exist, and now I'm going to worship like it's some sort of event. That's not true worship. True worship is not this mystical interlude outside of our difficult real lives. To worship in truth is to worship in the midst of those hard times. So, do you understand what worship is? A little better, anyway. It's in spirit and in truth. It is with my whole heart and with my whole being, who I am and what I do. We will see that theme throughout all of Scripture from cover to cover. Now, 
Let's look at how this plays out in a bad example and in a good example. And the first one we're going to look at is from Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. The story of Cain and Abel. Uh, I'm not going to assume that you're familiar with this story, uh, so I want, to, I want to summarize this for you a little bit. Um, this idea of worship in spirit and truth did not begin with Jesus. This was not a new idea that he introduced, that he was giving to the Samaritan woman. He didn't just say all of a sudden, you know all those things you guys have been doing for thousands of years, you were wrong. Now here's the right way. He was reminding her, look, this is what it's always been about. So in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, we get the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve. And by the way, this is just one of those interesting freebie things, really has nothing to do with today's sermon. But in my research this week, I read and learned that after the book of Genesis, you don't hear about Adam and Eve again until the New Testament. Like they are never brought up again in the entire Old Testament after Genesis chapter 3. Isn't that bizarre? I find that really strange. Yeah, I kind of, what? That's weird. Anyway, okay. That one was for free, you guys. The next one will cost you. No, not really. Um, So the story of Cain and Abel, here we go. Uh, Adam and Eve have children. Uh, Cain and Abel are are born and they're brothers, so they get along in perfect harmony, of course. Um, No, they don't get along in perfect harmony. But what God does is God gives them each a set of gifts and abilities, things that they can do to be productive and profitable in their lives. And uh, Abel, he makes a shepherd, and Cain, he makes a farmer. So let's read uh, verses 2 through 7. I don't really need to give you much more backstory because the main story is here in verses 2 through 7, and I'll kind of maybe summarize what happens afterwards. So here we go. Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Okay, let's just stop there for just a second. At this point, we might be tempted to think that the difference was in what they brought. Grain versus animal. That Cain's offering wasn't acceptable to God because he just brought some bread, right? And, you know, Abel did the real thing and he brought, like, he had a barbecue. And that God loves barbecue, apparently, right? So, like that, so that's why, you know, God said, don't give me no salad, I want the meat. No, it wasn't that at all. It had nothing to do with what they brought. We might also be tempted to say, well, yeah, but did you read how Cain only brought some of it? Well, did you read how Abel also only brought some of his? So it wasn't even about the amount that they brought, and it didn't specify. And keep in mind, at this point, God had not told anybody, at least according to what we know from Scripture, you're going to bring me offerings. So this was out of their free will. They, they just said, hey, we'll bring this to God. So what's the problem? Well, that's what we'll discover. So Continue with verse 5 here. Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. That means he was pouting. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. I love that picture. Isn't that a great picture? Just to remind you of how relentless the devil is in his temptation of you. Like he's going to, he wants to jump out and, and just tackle you, just smear you, right? That's, that's what sin wants to do. Verse 8, oops, no, verse 7, that was it, sorry. Okay, so then what happens after this, um, God says, you got you to gotta watch out for sin, sin wants to have you, and then Cain said, great, you're right, God, I'm sorry, I repent, forgive me, here's the best that I have to offer, No, that's not what happened. Otherwise, we wouldn't tell stories about Cain and Abel. Cain says to his brother Abe, he says, hey, Abe, let's go out for a hike. They go out for a hike, and while they're out there, Cain murders his brother, kills him because of jealousy, because of envy, because of just anger, because he was having a temper tantrum. God says to Cain, hey, where's your brother? This is there's some parallels here, by the way, um, in the story of Adam and Eve. I don't know if you, I don't have time to go into them all today, but, you know, remember when God, remember when Adam and Eve sin and they realize, oh no, we're naked, and they hide from God, and God says, where are you? It's the same sort of thing going on here. Hey, Cain, where's your bro? And what does Cain say? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You just kind of get that, 
you, you, you pick up on his attitude in that. He, basically what he's saying to God is, look, isn't that your job to watch out for him, not mine? Okay. Well, if you were a dad, you are a dad, and your kid says that to you? Mm. Mm-mm. Nope. All right. That doesn't happen in my house. Okay. So what happens then is, is Cain, listen, God gives Cain the warning and says, look, you got to watch out for sin. Sin will compound itself. One sin after another after another. We sin and then we sin to cover up our sin and then we sin to cover up the sin that we committed to cover up our sin. This is like the story of David and Bathsheba and everything that happened there. But Cain doesn't listen to God. Cain sins. God says, hey, where's your brother? Cain has an opportunity to repent and say, I killed him. I'm sorry. But he doesn't. He says, look, that ain't my job. You're God. What, don't you know where he is? And then God responds by saying this to Cain. He says, you're under a curse. You're driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it'll no longer yield its crops to you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So Cain is punished. Well, he reaps what he sows, right? He, he receives a fair reward for the sin that he has committed. What do we learn from this here? Well, listen, the difference here is not in what they brought, but in how they brought it. We have clues as to Cain's attitude from the way that he responds to God. Look, both men had a choice to bring their best and to do what was right, but only one did. That's what God said to him. Look, verse 7, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? In other words, you've had the choice here to do right or to do wrong, and you chose to do wrong, but if you do right, everything will be fine. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You see, Cain's heart and attitude were revealed in his defiant response to God. Am I my brother's keeper? Is that my job, God? I thought that was your job. So, Let's look a little bit. There's some, there's some positive lessons that we can learn from Abel here, but I think maybe the more important thing to, to glean from this passage is the what not to do provided to us by Cain. So let's take a look at the kind of worship that God rejects, the kind of worship that God says, get that out of here. I, I don't want that. It flows from an arrogant, prideful spirit. It's motivated by a selfish attitude. What's in it for me? What can I get from this? It offers what is good enough, not the best. See, God rejects worship that flows from this arrogant, prideful heart, a worship that feels obligated or entitled or deserving of something. Well, God, I showed up at church and I sang some songs and I put a 20 in the offering plate, so now bless me. God rejects that. He's ashamed of that. He doesn't, that's not what he wants. God doesn't want just whatever you can spare, you're good enough. God calls for and deserves your best. The worship that God rejects brings whatever it can spare or afford not to lose, not the best that it has to offer. The worship that God rejects, it's artificial. It's not grounded in the truth. Remember, Jesus said God is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. But the worship God rejects is not grounded in truth. It is pretentious. It tries to give the appearance of sincerity, but it is in fact artificial, insincere, and false. This is the very thing that Jesus raked the Pharisees over the coals for. You're out there putting on your religious show so that everybody will be really impressed by how spiritual you are, but inside you're rotten to the core. See, this has always been the case throughout all of Scripture and still today. God rejects this. Artificial worship, this worship that is not grounded in truth, denies the sovereignty of God. It it basically ignores or belittles God's ultimate power, knowledge, holiness, and wisdom. It says, I can give God less than the best and He won't even know, because if people can't tell, then God can't tell either. Well, that's a terrible mistake. This kind of worship, this artificial worship, thinks that God won't know the difference between the good enough that we bring Him and the best that we could give Him. It denies who he really is. It rejects who he really is. It tries to hide from God. And because of this, this artificial, pretentious worship does nothing to help us grow spiritually or guard our hearts or lives against sin and temptation's constant onslaught. Because it doesn't put God in his proper place in our lives, which is the ultimate authority and ruler 
and uh, father of our lives, because it doesn't give God his proper place, we don't grow spiritually. And we are, in a, we are vulnerable. We become vulnerable. When we worship in spirit and truth, God's spirit meets ours and he fills us. He fills us with his spirit. We become grounded in the truth. Our roots go down deeper into the truth of who God is. And when difficult times come, we are held fast. We are held strong. When sin and temptation come our way, we can resist them and we can say, no, I'm standing on the truth and I'm strengthened by God's spirit. But if we don't worship in spirit and truth, sin will have its way with us. So maybe One of the ways you can apply what I'm talking about here so far today is think about an area of your life in which sin has beset you, in which it has owned you, in which you are a slave to sin and you cannot overcome. Maybe the solution is to worship. It's to surrender who you are and what you want and how you are trying to control things and to give that to God and say, not my will, but your will. Maybe in that act of surrender and worship, you will find yourself victorious over sin instead of held captive by it. Worship that God rejects is arrogant and it is artificial, and we see that in the life of Cain. So Cain serves as a bad example and a warning, but I think we need good examples too, right? We we need good examples. So for a good example of what worship in spirit and truth looks like, from a time before there was a law, an Old Testament law, we're going to fast forward to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at the story of Abraham and Isaac, and this I guess we could call is acceptable worship. This is the worship that God accepts. So let me summarize for you as best as I can the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was a man who God literally called out to in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of his life, without any previous knowledge of God. And God says to Abraham, basically, hey, Abe, uh, God here, I just want you to know that I've chosen you and I'm sending you to a place that you don't know about yet, and when you get there, you're going to become the father of many nations, and the entire world will be blessed by you. Ready? Go. And Abraham, being a fiercely independent Eastern Montanan, says, I don't like what I hear. No, he didn't say that. He said, "Uh, okay. And he went, and he walked by faith to a place that God had not showed him yet. Now, Abraham was an old man. He had no kids, And yet God had said, I'm going to bless the entire world through your offspring. And Abraham kind of said, look, me and the old lady, we're, you know, she's an old lady and I'm an old guy and, you know, we we can't have kids anymore. And God says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Abraham takes matters into his own hands, quite literally, if you know the story. He takes matters into his own hands and he doesn't wait for God to fulfill his promise. Abraham takes matters into his own hands and has a son through a lady who is not his wife. It's a problem period in Abraham's life, okay? But he makes it through it, through the grace of God and through continuing to walk by faith. By the way, everybody has a chapter in their life that they don't want anybody to read. That's Abraham's. Unfortunately for him, we literally have the chapters that we get to read. But we can learn, we can learn from that from Abraham's life. So eventually, as Abraham walks by faith and as he trusts God, God provides for him a son, a son named Isaac. And Isaac is the most important thing in all of Abraham's world. Nothing matters as much to Abraham as his son, Isaac, whom he loves deeply, whom he cherishes, who for him is literally a picture of God's promise fulfilled. God says, I told you I was going to give you a son. Here he is. The world will be blessed through you. Then we get to Genesis 22, and God does something bizarre. Bizarre truly. In fact, when I was in uh, Bible college, I took a seminary course on Old Testament ethics, which was fascinating. This was one of the stories that we looked at. Like, was God ethical in asking Abraham to do what he actually did? So, what God says to Abraham is, hey, you know that boy of yours, Isaac, the one you love, not the other one that you don't love as much, who you, you know, you made because you couldn't wait for me, the one you really love, the most important thing in the world to you, I want you to give him to me. I want you to sacrifice him. Now, we might hear that and say, is this the same God that we read about in the Bible? Yes, it is. It is the same God. Uh, w- did God really want Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Would he, like, would he let him go through with that? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the whole thing was a test of Abraham's faith to see if Abraham would obey God or if he would do his own thing. So let's read 
the story here. Uh, let's pick it up from verse, uh, verse 9, Genesis 22, verse 9. So what's happened is Abraham goes to his son Isaac and says, hey, uh, we're going to go for a hike, <laughs> pretty much. We're going to go for a hike. We're going to go offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Here, you carry, you carry the wood. Isaac, we'll head on up the mountain. And Isaac, he's no dummy. He says, uh, where's the ram for the offering, Dad? Oh, God will provide it, son. And Isaac says, okay, Dad, let's go, right? So they head up the mountain. We get to verse 9. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You guys, he was about to go through with it. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. By the way, if you're reading the Old Testament and you see that phrase, the angel of the Lord, not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, most likely this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus himself. This, this is Jesus Christ calling out to Abraham saying, whoa, hold everything. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And the angel said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him because now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, let me just stop here. This is just a bizarre thought that I had. But, like, I've been hunting with some of you guys, and I know some of you have been hunting for a long time, and I know some of you can field dress a deer in, like, two minutes. Can you imagine how quick Abe got the job done here? Like, oh, ram, done. Like, eight seconds. Like, can you imagine how excited he was to see what God had provided for him? So listen what happens here. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it's been said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, which there's no higher standard by which God can swear, that because you have done this and have not withheld your, own, your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me, because you've obeyed. Not because you had good intentions, not because you knew the right thing to do, not because you were on time for church, or not because you suffered through learning another new song this week or whatever, it's because you did what I told you to do. Spirit and truth. It's so important. Now notice back here in verse 14, yeah, that Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, not Abraham is the greatest of all time. Because <laughs> he really could have, right? Right? This is the spot where Abe proved to everybody that he was the man. This is, this is like Abraham Arena right here, you know, Abraham Court at God's Arena or whatever. You know, we name, always name things after people. Abraham could have said, you know, I'm a pretty good dude. This is a big deal. Nobody else has ever done this. Maybe we should name this place after me, Abrahamville or something. But he doesn't. He says, it was God. We're going to remember what God did in this spot, not what I did, what God did in this spot. Notice the contrast in the outcomes in Cain's and Abraham's stories. Cain withheld much from God and was cursed to be a restless wanderer. Abraham withheld nothing and was blessed and became a source of blessing for countless others. This is the worship that God accepts. Most of Abraham's life, especially this event, exemplifies worship that God accepts, worship that is humble and willing to surrender and give. Now, this is an important thing to understand. Abraham's worship grew more sincere the more he learned that God can be trusted in difficult times. The same will be true of yours. Let me say that again because this is really important. Abraham's worship grew more sincere the more he learned that God can be trusted in difficult times. The same will be true of yours. Your worship will grow more sincere the more you learn about how God can be trusted in difficult times. Look, the worship that God accepts comes from a humble, sacrificial spirit. 
I am not great, God is. God has blessed me with everything I can give. This is refined by and matured by trials. Our worship becomes more sincere, becomes more real, the more hardship we go through. And we always have a choice in those moments. Just going through difficult times does not make us better worshipers. Responding in worship during difficult times makes us better worshipers. So, worship that God accepts holds nothing back from God. Remember what the angel said? Abraham, now I know that you wouldn't even withhold your son, your only son from me. There's nothing more important in this world to you than your son, and you were willing to give even him for me. Now that I know that, I'm going to fulfill this promise in you. I had to know that you could be trusted, Abraham. So most of Abraham's life exemplifies this worship that God accepts. If our spirit, if our heart is humble, then we'll recognize that everything we have comes from God anyway. So it's good and it's right to give it back to Him. Worship that God accepts celebrates the truth of God's goodness. It celebrates who God is and what God does, not who I am and what I feel. Now, who you are and what you feel, it, it matters. It's part of who God made us to be as human beings, but that cannot be the focus of our worship. Again, I draw your attention to how Abraham responds here. God provides the ram, provides the sacrifice. Abraham offers it to God and he says, you know what? This is the place where God provides. He is the source. This is who God is. He is my provider, my sustainer, my savior. True worship points to God and exalts him. It's not about me at all. So ultimately, acceptable worship, humble, sacrificial, truth-centered worship, it teaches me to trust and obey God in every area of my life, not just in the spiritual things. There's a real disconnect here in some of our lives, okay, where we have compartmentalized our lives and we say, this is my work box, this is my family box, this is my God box. Here I will worship, here and here I don't really need to because I have a box for worship. That's not true worship. True worship crosses the boundaries of these boxes, and it prompts us to walk in obedience, to take faith-filled risks. When God says something like, hey, Abraham, go to a land that I will show you, we say, oh, okay, I will go. And then he says, hey, I want you to go sacrifice your son. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And he says, okay, I will, I will do this. I will obey. It takes faith-filled risks because true worship knows who God is. It trusts who God is. It doesn't focus on how I feel or what I think. It focuses on the truth of God's goodness, God's grace, and God's mercy. And if we are not focused on those things, we will not worship God for those things. So true worship comes out of us in the midst of our difficult circumstances, in in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our struggles. And oftentimes what that results in, if you read through the Psalms again, is a new song unto the Lord. Why? Because I've never been in this mess before. I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, so I hadn't, didn't have the words to express it, so I wrote a new song. We sang a new song to express, here's a new mess for the same God. Worship in spirit and truth celebrates the truth of God's goodness. Because God can be trusted, I won't be afraid of the unknown. Worship in spirit and in truth. We see a bad example. We see a good example. Now what? What what do we do with this? I just say, all right, we're done. You're blessed. Go and do better next week. I mean, is that that what this comes down to? Well, that's part of it. Yeah, part of it is once you've learned something about Scripture, learned something about who you are and about who God is, yeah, then the next step is to begin obeying, begin putting that into practice. But sometimes it's helpful to have a practical way to do so. And so that's what I want to give you this morning is a practical way to take maybe one of these first steps towards becoming a true worshiper. What good is this information without an application? How can we start applying the truth we have learned from Scripture? It's interesting to me that the first occurrence of worship in Scripture was an offering. I'm about to ask you to cannonball into the deep end. See, when when we learn something new about God, when we learn something new about following God, about faith, like we we want to enter 
the pool by the steps, don't we? Like holding the railing and we just tiptoe and ooh, that's a little cold. I hate cold water, by the way. That's, that's a little cold. Ooh, I don't know. That's for the mature people. I can't get there yet. But notice that the first thing that God, the first act of worship in Scripture is, here's something that you've given me that doesn't belong to me, God, an offering. This is the point where many of you turn me out. Tune me out and say, oh, he's talking about money. That's what pastors always do. He's talking about money. always ask for money. Look, we didn't set up this system. (laughs) You want to get mad at somebody, get mad at God, I guess. But don't get mad at God. You know what? Trust him. Trust him. This, This area of giving is usually one of the final hurdles that we have to clear to become true worshipers. We start with the baby steps, right? With just little things, just a little bit here and a little bit there. And, oh, this is really difficult. I'm just learning how to walk. And I think, you know what? Like, plug your nose and let's just cannonball into the deep end. Let's do this. Listen, if you can learn to give up things that are important to you, then the rest of this gets a little bit easier. It truly does. It's often in giving that we unlock something in us. Something in us breaks free when we give. The first occurrence of worship in Scripture was an offering, giving back to God some of what He has blessed us with. Isn't He good? He doesn't say, look, here's all the things that I'm going to provide for you, now give it all back. He says, keep almost all of it. Give some back as a sign that you recognize that you remember who this comes from. God doesn't need it. God's not broke, you guys. God doesn't need it. He doesn't need your money. He's not up there with like 38 cents in his checkbook going, holy cow, if Matt doesn't give this month, I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy. That does not happen, okay? So, giving. This is probably the most difficult way for many Christians to worship. I'll sing... I have to. I'll serve if you make me. Just don't ask me to give. So let's start in the deep end. See, worshiping through giving is a way to worship in spirit. How? Well, it's from the heart. Giving humbles us because it acknowledges our dependence on God. So giving comes from a humble, sacrificial spirit, or at least biblical giving does. God is not impressed by giving that says, if I have to, I guess, here. Pry it out of my hand. That's how I feel about taxes, okay? Like, yeah, yeah, if you have to take it, take it. It's not like that with giving. That's not, God doesn't accept that. God doesn't want us to give like that. The kind of giving that reflects worship is a humble, sacrificial spirit. Giving is an antidote to arrogance and pride. Here's how. When we don't give, when we refuse to give, when we hold everything to ourselves, we say, this is mine. I earned this. I worked hard for this. Nobody else should get this except me. When you can willingly open your hands and give, that arrogance and that pride starts to wither away because you recognize, okay, maybe I worked hard and maybe I earned this, but the opportunity to do so came from God. The resources came from God. When, when we hold our fists clenched, clenched tightly, we can't receive anything back. We have to open them up to receive something from God. So giving is an opportunity to worship in spirit. It changes our heart. Giving changes your heart. It's also an opportunity to worship in truth. Listen, this is an opportunity for us to literally put our money where our mouth is. You ever think of it like that? Oh, God, you're so good, and I worship you, and I love you, and you're so great, and thank you for blessing, and you mean and give? What? This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. This, this proves that what we are saying with our mouths is actually truly happening in our hearts. Through giving, we can literally put our money where our mouth is. If we claim that God and His kingdom are priorities to us, then we will gladly and generously give to the work of the Lord. Giving demonstrates that your heart is aligned. Giving demonstrates to God. Don't care about what people think. Giving demonstrates to God that your heart is aligned with Him and His priorities and that you trust Him completely. So, starting this week, 
I want to challenge you to give in a way that you have not given before. Now, if you are a guest with us, or if you are new with us, you may be wondering, okay, what are they, what's he really asking for? I want you to know that I am not asking you at this time to give your money to our church. What we have decided to do as an opportunity to, for some of you to learn how to give or to give generously is we want to encourage you over the next four weeks, this entire month, to give to the Great Commission Fund. Let me explain what that is. Our church, Glenlivet Alliance Church, is part of the denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance. In the Christian and Missionary Alliance, missions is literally our middle name. This denomination was founded on this idea that the best way to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, to the least reached people, to the darkest places on the planet, is to form an alliance between Christians who have resources and missionaries who are called to go. We stand in the middle. So what we want to invite you to do is to become a giving partner with the Great Commission Fund. Every penny that comes in for this goes right out our doors to our national headquarters to send mission, missionaries onto the field. Every, every penny of it. We don't, we don't see any of it. Okay? So just in case you are thinking, well, of course you're asking us for money and to give because you want it for the church. No, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see a penny of this. Okay? So I want to be clear about that. But here's how, I want you to, here's, here's how I want to challenge you to give to the Great Commission Fund. First of all, if you are not giving, start. Start somewhere. Start somewhere. Secondly, if you're giving a little or maybe infrequently, give a little more or give a little more frequently. If you're already giving regularly, I dare you to give generously. In, in fact, there's one passage in Scripture that talks about giving hilariously. Like, that's actually how the word, word is translated, hilariously. Like, I'm just giving so much of God's money away, it's hilarious. I'm losing my mind, right? Like Oprah throwing out, whatever, offerings for everybody. Kind of that sort of a picture. Like, God has just blessed me so much, I just can't get rid of it fast enough. I dare you to see what God does if you give generously. All month, starting this Sunday and going on through the whole month, we'll be giving you an opportunity to worship through giving by collecting a special offering for the Great Commission Fund. Now, we're not going to pass the offering plates to do that. In fact, we haven't done that in months, and nobody has missed it. Nobody has said, I loved it when we passed the offering plates around here so that everybody could see what I put in or don't put in or whatever. No, nobody misses that. Um, we have boxes set up for people to give offerings. So for the Great Commission Fund offering, we will have a box set up beginning this Sunday in the lobby. It's just labeled Great Commission Fund. Now, if you are a regular giver to the Great Commission Fund, you can keep doing it the way you have been doing it. You can give it on your, your regular offering check or online or whatever. But for those of you who have not made this a part of your giving, this is the challenge. We challenge you to do that, and we invite you to join us in this opportunity to worship together. Now, we recognize that most of you didn't come prepared for a challenge like this this Sunday. That's fine. That's why we're extending it through the whole month. And it, by the way, you may learn that it's kind of fun, and you may want to give additionally and beyond this. So giving, to me, seems to be the right place to start. You might say, wow, Matt, that's, you're really just jumping into it right away. Yeah, so, yeah, so what? I, I trust God. I trust that God is speaking to your heart. I trust that he's speaking to you, and if he's challenging you to give, I trust that you'll obey. And if he's not at this time, if he's not saying, you know what, that's not for you right now, I'd question that, I guess. But if he's saying that to you, that that's, you know, it's not the right time, let's work on some other things, I'm, I'm going to trust that too. I'm going to trust God's spirit in you, leading you to do what you think is right. We're not looking to micromanage this. We're not looking to profit on this. What we are looking to do is to challenge you to take the next step forward in becoming a true worshiper, which is to give abundantly and without reservation. And we want to give you the opportunity to do that. So let's pray about this, 